Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Compassion in Politics live conversation series in which we talk to politicians, activists and thinkers about the current state of politics and how it can be improved. I'm really delighted that tonight our guest is the journalist and author Gavin Esler. Gavin was the main presenter for BBC's Newsnight from 2003 to 2014. Before that, he was in the States reporting from Washington as the BBC's chief North America correspondent. And he's also presented a host of other BBC programmes. He left the BBC in 2017 and two years later, he stood as a candidate for Change UK in the 2019 European elections. He's the author of five novels and four non-fiction books. Yes, I don't know how he found the time. The most recent of which, How Britain Ends, English Nationalism and the Rebirth of Four Nations was published last month and examines the ways in which English nationalism risks pulling the United Kingdom apart. Gavin, welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Very nice to be here, Jennifer, and hello to everyone watching and listening. So I wanted to start by asking you about your book with its rather ominous title, How Britain Ends. What, what is your most dire prediction for what could happen to the United Kingdom? Well, there's quite there a few is. dire predictions. <laughs> I think actually my most dire prediction is that the political class in London in particular seems to make a virtue out of muddling through that phrase is used repeatedly, particularly in England, to do with England. And muddling through has ceased, in my view, to be um, a way of operating. It's become a destination. Uh, but we're okay, we'll just somehow muddle through. And it's obvious in Brexit, but it's obvious also in other things. And so I, I don't think, I mean, I don't think when I uh, came up with the title How, How Britain Ends, it wasn't that it will become balkanized or that there'll be some rioting in the street or something but it will just slowly sink into mediocrity i mean the real the real impetus to the book there were there were two two things that prompted me one was this sense of um a warning or a challenge to unionists what is the union of the united kingdom for it used to be for centuries protestantism empire and war any historian will tell you those three were the pillars of empire and it worked right through to the end of the Cold War. Um, but now what is it? It's not any of those things. So what does it mean? And who speaks for the United Kingdom? Not who speaks for England. I think Boris Johnson certainly speaks for part of England, but he doesn't speak for Scotland or Northern Ireland and not very much for Wales either. So that was my challenge to unionists. My challenge to nationalists is, if you talk about independence, what do you actually mean in an interdependent world? Uh, we've seen how difficult it was to not even manage to um, get Brexit done. We obviously haven't. How difficult that has been over the past five years for all of us. So what would it mean to be an independent Scotland? How would that relate to other places? And the same uh, would be even more difficult, I think, for Wales and Northern Ireland, but not impossible. And I think the tectonic plates of our union are moving apart. So that's, that's really the, the force behind the book. And you warn that those tectonic plates could shift apart unless we we have more devolution. Is that what you see as a solution? Yes, I mean, uh, uh, about two thirds of the book is really talking about the different nationalisms in uh, in these islands and their roots and, and how ingrained they are and how we've got along uh, as, as British people for a long time, but why that is coming to an end. Uh, and there's... The, there's a lot of surveys for just for example if you ask people how they would introduce themselves to a stranger it used to be most of us would have said british but now more, more and more english people are saying english first and scottish people are saying scottish first and welsh people welsh first and so on so that that may seem like a small thing but cultural differences always lead to political differences and part of what i looked at was how how is britain actually constructed because we have got the most centralized, powerful executive anywhere in Europe, it seems to me. I mean, this whole question of the crown in parliament, the unwritten constitution actually means that a prime minister can do pretty much what he or occasionally she um, feels that they would like to do and can uh, get things done with, in Boris Johnson's case, 43% of the vote. He's got a majority of 80. 
uh, and the uh, threat of proroguing Parliament. I mean, it wasn't quite as simple as he hoped. <laughs> exactly. And so there are checks and balances within the system. Uh, but what I what I uh, suggest in the book is that we have actually federalized by stealth. We haven't done what other countries have done, like Germany, have to rewrite our, you know, what, what are we for as Germans or Switzerland, which took just 50, 56 days, I think it was, to write their constitution, um, or America in disentangling from Britain. We haven't had to do that. But what we have done is we have bumbled through and muddled through and we've created a Scottish Parliament, which is elected one way, a Welsh Parliament, which is elected another way, a Northern Ireland Parliament, which is elected in a third different way, all of which, in my view, are better than the way the Westminster Parliament is elected. And each of those, just for, just for example, coronavirus, should have pulled us all together. Well, it has up to a, a point, and we're all very grateful that the vaccination program's working, but there isn't one chief medical officer in the United Kingdom. There's four, one each for the devolved um, nations, and, and the English one acts as the advisor to the UK government. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's a kind of federal system which extends to everything. We have no national religion. I'm pleased about that, but the Church of England's established in England, sends bishops to the House of Lords, not true in Scotland. Uh, we don't have an education system. We have several. The Scottish education system, which I grew up in, is completely different. And so my suggestion is that since people, uh, unlike uh, Mr. Johnson, who said that devolution is a mistake, uh, people in Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland generally don't think so, maybe England has got a democratic deficit and more devolution, more power to the great cities of Manchester and Birmingham and Liverpool, more county, more uh, power to various counties might actually end England's democratic deficit because part of what I talk about is a sense of grievance within England which was channeled to we, we've got to take back control from Brussels where actually what it seems to me would be the more important point would be to get more control from Westminster. And you talk about Englishness what would you actually say Englishness is? You're quite harsh about it in the book. It means uh, that we won uh, the war, only we didn't. <laughs> well, well, you see, there's, a, there's a, let, me, let, me, let me quote a, a bit from the Times. Times. I, I, I love this because this was the Times uh, last year. It said, and I quote, front page, Iranian protesters burnt the Union Jack outside the British Embassy in Tehran last night as the diplomatic crisis over the arrest of the UK ambassador grew and they chanted death to England. So you've got, England, the UK and Britain and the Times has merrily confused them and most of us haven't really cared about it very much. But those confusions are changing uh, and uh, particularly uh, people in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland would never make the mistake of saying that English is the same as British. And because England is by far the most important part of the Union, 84% of the population live in England, London itself is more Greater London, at least, is more popular, populous than the other three nations put together. It's inevitable that, um, that England will be the elephant in the bed. The trouble is the elephant has become increasingly restless and the Brexit debate, when England voted to leave and Scotland and Northern Ireland voted to remain, has just thrown that into really acute focus. And um, th that makes it that makes the union very, very difficult, especially since in Scotland, people were promised in 2014 that if they voted to stay in the United Kingdom, that was the only way they could stay in the European Union. So that's why I say the tectonic plates are, are shifting. Englishness, um, more and more people, I'm sure you've we've all seen over the past 20 years since devolution to Scotland and Wales in particular, you see more English flags and nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with being very proud of the England football team or the England rugby team, less so of the England rugby team recently, but you know, <laughs> they've, done, they've been doing very well. Um, there's nothing wrong with that, but there's a sense of um, Englishness, which is exceptional, that it is, we're better than everybody else. And you get it from the prime minister. Uh, everything he does is world beating apparently. And, when I was in Scotland in August 2019, um, I was really struck by friends of mine I grew up with who voted to stay in the United Kingdom, voted against Scottish independence, 
but were outraged that they were being taken out of the European Union against their will by broadly, mostly English, English voters, as they put it. And one said to me, you know, Boris Johnson says he is a one nation conservative. He is, but that one nation is England. And in Northern Ireland, three months later, I happened to be in Belfast um, in October 2019, after Mr. Johnson met Leo Varadkar, uh, the Irish Prime Minister at the Wirral. And he basically booted 100 years of Ulster unionism into the Irish Sea. He was somebody who had said the border in Ireland is no more significant than the border between, I think it was Islington and Westminster, which caused, you know, hilarity, I suppose, in, in Ireland, among other things. And then in changing that border and putting it in the Irish Sea, as, as somebody said to me in Northern Ireland, you know, the, uh, Mrs. Thatcher said, Northern Ireland is as British as Finchley. Boris Johnson says it's as British as France, in customs terms at least. Now, even if you don't agree with these things, that's the way in which sentiment has changed. And he is seen very much as an in outside England, perhaps in some in England as well, as a little Englander, an English nationalist prime minister who doesn't speak for the United Kingdom in the way that, uh, that other Prime Ministers would have done, Churchill would have done, or Blair would have done, very much, or Gordon Brown uh, certainly would have done, and that is a problem. And there's an irony in there as well, isn't there, that the Prime Minister who wanted to make Britain great again is the Prime Minister who has in fact sown the seeds that could lead to its downfall. Yes, and it's it's not just me, me saying it, it's um, George Osborne, Conservative Chancellor of the Exchequer wrote in the Evening Standard last month that Boris Johnson could be uh, worse than Lord North, the worst prime minister ever. Lord North was the, the man who lost, lost the American colonies, having, as in, in Mr. Osborne's words, unleashed English nationalism. And it's quite a contentious statement, but it's very, very clear that George Osborne and traditional Tories uh, see that as a problem. And from the Labour Party, Gordon Brown has said uh, we may be becoming, the United Kingdom may be becoming a failed state if we don't do something about it. And my, my suggestion is that Mr Johnson is, is not the messenger and doesn't have the message to speak for the United Kingdom in the way that people have in the past. And frankly, I don't know who does have that ability to do that. One of the things I find really refreshing in your book is, is the way you talk about nationalism not in the hedged well it could possibly be seen as nationalism but but you essentially equate Brexit with the rise of nationalism is that fair? Yep. Ab absolutely and one of the one of the things that is interesting is I've had done a lot of discussions with English audiences and so on and there is for some an embarrassment about a degree of nationalism that some people have said to me I, I don't have a problem with England flags at football matches or anywhere else I think it's great personally, but there's some English people that have always found that difficult. And in fact, one of my favorite quotes is a modern English historian, David Edgerton, has written a really interesting book about, um, about the, the history of the United Kingdom, which he suggests is coming to an end. And he says, he's got this great phrase, nationalism in British parlance was the doctrine which encapsulated the dubious claims of natives, whether Indian, African, Irish, Scottish, Welsh. And he's a very ironic Englishman who is pointing out that it's sometimes difficult for some English people either to be proud of their own nationalism or even to recognize that it exists. I've heard, I've heard very few hostile comments about the book, but a couple have said, there's no such thing as English nationalism. That's why we're better than other people. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, None that, so blind as those who can't see. <laughs> Yes, but I mean, I'm, I, I, what part of part of what I'm saying is there's 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 nothing wrong with being proud of being a member of a nation. The question is whether the political entity that you're part of reflects that. And the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland has been able to cope with this for a very long time, and doesn't seem to be able to cope with it now. Partly, in my view, is because Westminster is has too much power. And is a very very odd system with you know a non-elected upper chamber which i don't think any other demo democracy in europe has and and uh, a lower house elected by this by a, a method that dates from the horse and cart period rather than the 21st century absolutely and you'd like to see a written constitution 
Yes, I mean, I don't think constitutions are, written constitutions are uh, a panacea. I mean, we see in the United States, it can cause all kinds of problems, but they are a rough guide. And, you know, this is another uh, thing, <laughs> thing that amuses me, which is that British academics and lawyers have written, according to the historian Linda Colley, who I really admire, constitutions for more than 70 countries around the world, former British colonies, post-war Germany, post-war Iraq, but we haven't written a constitution for ourselves, or at least we've, we, we have codified it. There's lots of bits, but I draw the parallel between uh, the constitution of all these bits and pieces, which only experts understand, and they all argue about, as we've seen when Boris Johnson tried to prorogue parliament and, and uh, the Supreme Court decided against it, and then we've had members of the Conservative Party saying we, we better sort out the Supreme Court. I mean, that, that kind of conflict uh, has got to be resolved somehow. Unfortunately, it was resolved with a reasonable degree of good sense, but not everybody in politics has good sense or good judgment or compassion. And that is, that is a problem. And there is nothing, there's no magic wand of a, of, of a written constitution, but at least it gives people a reasonable idea of how countries, how bits and pieces can cohere. And if the, di the different parts of the United Kingdom are moving apart, it might be a good idea to decide who's responsible for what um, in a, a clearer way than we have done up to now. And you talk about nationalism as, as not having a problem with nationalism, but of course, what many people associate with nationalism is the othering that happens with it mm -hmm. and the tinges or, you know, racism that often sadly accompanies it. Um, and that's my way of segueing to America, where you were a correspondent and there was that interview on television last night. And I wondered, you know, how much sympathy you had with with the Sussex's arguments about the way the media has handled them and the racism that they've uh, A lot, uh, essentially. I mean, a, a great deal of sympathy uh, for, for all, all kind, kinds of reasons. But I mean, the, the <laughs> it was a very, let me just take two examples from British newspapers over the past week. On Saturday, I didn't buy this newspaper, but a British tabloid, tabloid had on the front page that Meghan was in a plot to appear on Oprah Winfrey before she even met Harry. Now, uh, terrorists engage in plots to blow up airliners or blow up buildings to, for an actor, as she is, uh, to want to appear on Oprah Winfrey is not a plot, it's a media strategy, <laughs> it's public relations, it's what actors do. I just thought that was very interesting, the way in which that was framed. So it's framed in a way that she must be bad. Um, and then on in the Times yesterday, the Times front page lead had a, a story about Her Majesty the Queen talking to the Commonwealth. And it said, in the front page of the Times, uh, this is being interpreted as, as her talking about how good um, service was as a real kick in the teeth to Meghan and Harry. They put slightly different words. Well, by whom? Who, who was it? I wasn't interpreting as that. I was interpreting it as the Queen talking as she does every year to the Commonwealth and suggesting public service is a good thing. So um, the you could come up with all sorts of, in my view, uh, essentially the media, particularly the popular media, likes, treats uh, the royal family as uh, not as journalism, but as a kind of romantic fiction where they have to be heroes and they have to be villains and they have to be dastardly and always bad. And it's very convenient for some of them, it seems to me, that one of those people that they choose to bully uh, happens to be a woman, happens to be an American, and happens to be of African-American heritage. Now, uh, could all be just coincidental, but I don't think so. And, and, you know, in this instance, it's very clear with the royal family, but of course this racism pervades so much of the media and so much of the way what happens in politics is interpreted. What, what was your experience? You worked at the BBC at the heart of, you know, the most famous broadcaster in the world. Did you encounter those kind of colonial attitudes as Harry put it last night? Not, 
Not actually at the BBC. And in fact, my closest colleagues, I, I can say uh, two or three of my closest colleagues happen to be uh, British Asian women who the one thing they they had very little common in common, except that they were very good at their jobs in different different ways. But they all said to me, the one thing we don't want anybody to think is that we're being promoted either because we're women or we from a British Asian background, which I thought was interesting. It, I mean, it never, frankly, in the, the cases of, of those particular colleagues, it never occurred to me. So I'm not saying racism doesn't exist in big institutions, but I didn't, I didn't have it mentioned to me by people of color that I work, worked with. Um, however, I do think that there is a kind of naivety about it in a way, and that uh, the response to the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, this, you know, I, I don't think people should throw statues in the river. I don't think that's a good idea. But I have to say that the response to that has been quite extraordinary, really. I mean, it has been, it has been that it's a denial of our history. Actually, Black Lives Matter wants more history. It doesn't want less. It wants us to know that Cecil Rhodes had certain views about people of color or, uh, you know, uh, people that we have memorials to across Britain may actually have made their money before they gave it away from oppressing other people. And to describe some of them as philanthropists always <laughs> kind of sticks in my, how can you be, how can we, say in the 21st century, someone's a philanthropist because they gave money away that they made off the backs of people who were in slavery. Now, uh, uh, so the sensitivity to that among some white people, or particularly of a particular, uh, of a certain age, strikes me as um, uh, very, very unfortunate and a real, it, it slow down, slows down change, but I don't think younger people, most younger people, want to buy into that kind of society anymore. But there's something in there, again, about the polarisation, the way the British media loves to set one group up against the other, those who are for history, those who are against history. And, you know, obviously our concern at Compassion in Politics is how to improve politics so that it embodies more compassion and so that people deal with each other with more compassion, but it strikes me that it's very difficult. You know, it'd be very difficult to have a leader who said, actually, I don't know the answer, or actually, I'm not sure, or I think I've made a mistake. Can I just think about that? Or, you know, we did try it, but it didn't work. So we're going to do something differently because the media would pounce on them. So there's this toxic relationship between how the media covers politics and how politics is conducted. I, no, I, I agree. And I think from my own personal experience, uh, the only front rank government minister in any administration I remember saying I don't know about something was David Miliband once on Newsnight. I can't remember what I, I can't even remember what I was asking him about. I think it was Libya, may not have been, but I think it was. What should we do about Libya, foreign secretary? And he said something like, I don't know. Uh, it's really difficult. I'm going to have to think about it and take more expert advice. Now, that was so surprising. And I talked to him and other people afterwards about why you don't do it. And, um, and he said, because some interviewers would have said, what do you mean you don't know? You're the foreign secretary. Um, so somehow we've got to be a bit more grown up, I think, and be beyond that. The trouble is, uh, and this is a bit that some people listening will get annoyed about. Actually, it's not just the journalists who do it. It's the viewers like it. Some viewers like it, and I know people will say, oh, no, I don't. I don't like that kind of stuff. But they do, and they turn on to it, which is why some people, who should remain nameless, who walked off a TV programme this morning, um, build a career out of it. It's, it's sort of, it's why shock jocks work in the United States. We're slightly different here, but we're not a great deal different. No, and it may be more nuanced and more subtle, but it's still Punch and Judy, isn't mm -hmm. it? It's it is. Yeah. And who I, I, won the battle? Who won PMQs? You know, it's it's about the little fights rather than the bigger picture. But but also, uh, I'm not shuffling off responsibility from journalists to politicians. But we have a political system where we've got two sides of the house that shout at each other and bray at each other. Other places, including Scotland, actually have a horseshoe arrangement, and they quite often have coalitions. 
uh, or at least informal coalitions, because the SNP... And they also don't well. shout. I remember visiting Hollywood and thinking, I wonder where the main chamber is, because everyone was sitting but up <laughs> with desks and had laptops in front of them. I thought that can't possibly be the Parliament building. It's become so normalised the way we do politics. It, it has. And, uh, you know, there's, yeah, uh, and there's a lot of problems in American politics too, but in general, they don't quite shouted they do in the streets and with trump and so on but they don't quite do the, do the same thing so we have a very adversarial system in which um and uh, and also part of it i happen to be talking to people over the, the last 24 hours i can't say who they are but i know that um uh, mps both within the conservative and labor party who have different views and would like to be in your word more compassionate or at least would like to work together both know that their constituency parties are filled with people who are on the extremes of their parties and as conservatives or labor they might have been deselected and that is a real problem because actually very few of us join a political party and in the case of one conservative mp who was deselected uh, i understand he got many phone calls from friends of his this is before the last election uh, within the party to say, oh, we really support you, but we can't actually publicly say so because my constituency party would have me out as well. That's that's not a very good system, it seems to me. We have a real issue there, but they're all interrelated, aren't they? It, they're all interrelated mm -hmm. because we're about winning and losing. Yes. Whether we're a faction or whether we're a party, we're about winning or losing. We're not about the issue, how to reduce poverty, how to improve education, although we go in with that ideology, it becomes about, yeah, them or yeah. us. Well, exactly, and therefore it doesn't become, it's not about problem solving. And it has, an, it has, it has another real problem with this, which is sometimes, um, uh, you, you know, I do, uh, I've been doing quite a lot of public meetings over the past e year, at least on Zoom, and then before that, um, uh, going around uh, touring with another book. And one of the questions I quite often ask people is, how do you become Chris Grayling? I mean, how do you get to, uh, he's a decent enough fellow, but he, he's not very, he's, he's, he's got a track record of being not very good. And the answer is you're loyal to the party line and you stick with the party line. And there are equivalents in the Labour Party as well. And you don't, you don't rock the boat, whoever is, is the leader. And again, that's not going to solve problems. That's going to create problems. You left the BBC and then you plunged straight into politics. Having been an observer and a commentator on politics, you became a politician. How was that experience? Uh, it, was, it was fascinating, actually. I mean, I should say that I, I, when you say I became a politician, I joined Change UK mostly because it didn't really exist. So therefore, as a political party, there were lots of very nice people in it. And we did, we got 117,000 votes in London. That was, you know, and I, I, but it was people who, like me, were worried about the way the country was going and didn't feel they fitted into any existing political party for various reasons. And I didn't, and the other reason I, 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 I thought it was worthwhile having a go was that I didn't have to apologise for anything the party had done in the past because we hadn't done anything. We, we only lasted about I don't know, four months or something. Um, but it was it was very revealing. It was very revealing both about the dedication of people in politics. Secondly, how you do need a political apparatus, otherwise you can't get through to people. And thirdly, uh, about sections of the media who m most of the time, you know, most, most journalists uh, don't get up in the morning thinking about how they can distort what someone says or lie. Most of them really are in the information business and are trying to offer insights and they have access. There's one or two, including some very, very top names who just want to be deceitful and who know how to do it by taking selected quotes. And there's one, for, just for example, I was asked um, by one journalist uh, perfectly fairly, something about experts and Michael Gove saying we've had enough of experts and I said well look Michael Gove may have said that but when Michael Gove wants his teeth fixed he doesn't go to the village idiot he goes to um, uh, a dentist or someone with a degree. Um, one well-known columnist put that into the newspaper as I'd said that anyone supporting Brexit was a village idiot. Now what do you do about that? 
do you complain? Is it actually worth it? There's no way of complaining about something like that. And, and that person uh, is still gainfully employed. Uh, so I began to feel for those politicians who had said things that were taken out of, truly taken out of context or had done, done things which were minor, minor sins um, like the rest of us, you know, parking in the wrong place or, you know, uh, there was the politician who was, I think, drinking a beer or a gin and tonic on a train. Well, you know, frankly, <laughs> I think some So you, you gain more it. sympathy for the political yeah. class from having been under that scrutiny yourself. De definitely, definitely. Um, but, I, but I also saw how some do get a bit of a free pass uh, some of the time. And has it put you off? Would you run again? Would you consider entering into active politics again? Um, I just the, the problem is the two party system, really. I don't know if I, I don't know if I could bear to sit through meetings of a constituency party. It would have to be. <laughs> I mean, I think people, you know, I, I know quite a few polit uh, politicians who I think are great really really great people it won't help them if i say who they are but they're, they're they're in different parties and i don't agree with everything they do but i know how hard they work it is extraordinary um and if i thought i could do something uh, in in politics that wouldn't involve me actually saying things that i don't really believe or towing a party line or something um, I mean, for instance, I just cannot understand how any any MP in the Conservative Party can be unhappy with a one percent increase for nurses. I just I just couldn't do it. Could not do it. I think that's just appalling. Um, so <laughs> that would be rather difficult. And then we did have those twenty two Conservatives who who did put. Their, their beliefs before their party at the end of the last parliament who didn't come back to parliament. So that's the other problem, isn't it? That those people who are most interested in consensus building or prioritizing their values over their political gain. Yeah. I feel I, they have a place. I think that's right. And they are, one of the obvious problems is that they're some of the most valuable people that should be in politics because they know how the system works and they are prepared up to a up to a point to cooperate. I, I sometimes, this is a an odd story, but when I, I, I started as a journalist, um, I got to know a very, um, a very prominent uh, Washington Post columnist called Mary McGrory. So I was about 24, 25, and I help, helped her a bit in, in Northern Ireland. So when I went to America, she introduced me to the people in politics. She was a very, very fine columnist and a very powerful columnist in, in Washington. And what was interesting was um, it was during the Reagan period. And so I'm sort of 23, 24 or whatever. And all these, all these powerful Democrats are saying, oh yeah, well we attack him during the day, but we're quite happy to have a drink with him in the evening with Reagan because he was a charming guy. Now, I know a lot of people hated Reagan and a lot of people hate the Democrats and so on, but they didn't dislike each other in the way you might think, and in the way that Trump fermented. It was, a, it was divided politically, but it was also collegiate in terms of how they saw American interests, I think. And how comparable do you think the divisions that have arisen as a result of Trump in the United States are to the divisions that have arisen in the UK as a result of Brexit? Well, I think- and That, that I think hate being unleashed. Yeah, I think, I think there's two things and that they're interconnected. One is hate dislike the belief. I mean, I've got a couple of friends who voted for Brexit. I don't despise them. They're still friends of mine. I still see them. I, I try not to ask them how they think it's going because it's not, <laughs> but we still, we still get on. Um, but the thing that Trump did is he normalized lying in politics. And we have this here. We have people who just simply make it up every day. And if you, if you try to say, but you said something different yesterday, or that's simply not true, the answer is that they get some, they say something else. And we've never had that before. I mean, people, we, everybody lies occasionally. We all, we all say things that are wrong, refuse to correct them because we're stubborn, or occasionally are downright deceitful. But this pattern of lying, which Trump um, was at the center of in America, is also something that we have here. And it is a real problem. I mean, to have just just for example, to have been told that
that um, by the prime minister of our country that we did everything we could on coronavirus when he missed five Cobra meetings. <laughs> well, yeah, right at the start. I mean, that's, there's a lot, lot of other stuff. Um, so what do you do? And what do you do as a journalist? Do you, every time this happens, do you say, sorry, that's wrong, that, that's wrong. That's, a, that's not a fact, that's a misstatement. That's a downright lie, that's deceitful. If you said that with Trump, you would be doing it, according to the Washington Post, more than 20 times a day, some, some days. In fact, during the, his re-election campaign, they said it was up to 50 times a day, that it was something which was false, which was said and was not corrected. Now, we're not that bad, but what do journalists do about this? Do they constantly interrupt and say, that's, that's, that's not true, that's not true. Very tricky, I think. Very, very tricky. And in fact, I mean, the public response is so visceral to that. The most successful campaign that we've run was on lying in politics. And we had 200,000 people sign a petition within very sh a short period of time to say they'd like lying in politics made into a crime. And, and maybe not a crime, but in the same way as if you misrepresent a car and selling it there are consequences. So there's no, there, there is no recourse in the way there would be in any other area of life or any other business. If you misrepresent the truth and someone acts to their detriment in reliance upon it, there is absolutely nothing that we can do. And of course, even though journalists may point out that it, things are a lie, it, it almost feels as if that's not what matters anymore. We're, almost in an age where it, it's become about identity and psychological survival rather than about factual truth. Yeah, I think that I think that's that's true as well. Uh, and I think the I think the other thing that you see, I I um, I wrote, wrote a book a few years ago about how leaders tell stories to make other people follow them. And the basic number of premises in the book that, that every leader tells the same kind of story. Who am I? I'm a great guy or a great woman. Uh, this is my background. Who are we, the Democratic Party or Manchester United Football Club or whatever it is, and then where are we going with this? And everybody kind of does the same thing. Even, even Trump did it. I'm the world's greatest businessman. Uh, who are we? We're the people of real patriots. And where are we going to take us? We're going to make America great. Every, every, everybody does it. What I hadn't figured, <laughs> factored in all those years ago was how people would get away with lying by, by a snowball effect, that there are so many of them that you don't have time to check them and you just assume that everybody does it and it just degrades the currency it just makes uh public life so so much worse and i'm not i'm i'm not sure what we can do about that except to insist that facts occasionally in the end do matter and i think for instance brexit is a good example of that that for five years almost five years um, people said, well, trade deals aren't going to work. Um, you know, this is, America's not going to roll over and give us a great trade deal. The European Union is not going to accept uh, that what we're going to get is going to be what you've told us. And now we're beginning to see it. And as coronavirus recedes, I hope it will, we will unfortunately see it more. We're seeing it, musicians, a good example. We have a no deal Brexit for musicians and, and creative arts. Yeah, that's what we have. They, they, you know, they can go to uh, various countries abroad, but they can't play for money. <laughs> so, so what is the point? And this is part of our soft power. And we'll start to realise it more and more as I think coronavirus recedes, but it's going to be very difficult to reverse. Absolutely. And so both in journalism and politics, we have the same problem, which is how we can actually tell the truth and 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 um, our democratic process is under threat if if the truth disappears people aren't making their decisions based on mm -hmm. fact it's yeah. it's it's frightening now we've got a question who has come that's coming from Charles he says he agrees with you Gavin about the two party system do you think movements for example the European movement with Lord Adonis recently appointed chair may be a more satisfying way of trying to sway opinion well, I think, you know, I think um, various, I, I don't think political activism is pointless. Absolutely not. I think Marcus Rashford has shown us that if you've got the right message and you're the right person, you can really get things done and you can really embarrass uh, governments into, into doing things. And I think that may be true of the nurses as well. I hope, I hope so. Um, the European movement is, is a more difficult case, I think, uh, it's simply because I think to go back to Neil Kinnock's phrase about 
uh, not everybody spends all day thinking about politics. I think a lot of people would like not to think about the European Union anymore because Brexit is done, which it's not done. Uh, so I think, I think being in a position to have an organization like the European movement that can communicate with people at the right moment, and the right moment I think will start this summer, because for example, if we're all able to do ha have holidays abroad, and we're all able to go to that favorite beach that we've got in Spain or a favorite city in Italy or whatever it is. Uh, and then suddenly we find that we're in the queue for the also rans or we've got problems with our visas or we've got, you know, the, the, the day trip that some people wanted to make to some place for business suddenly becomes more, much more complicated. We will see that it's not just the fishing industry. It's not just creative arts and so on. It's us. And that's where the European movement and others can come in and say, this is what we found out, you know, join us and change people's opinion. So I don't think I, I don't think any of it's hopeless. I just think it is quite difficult to, and the same is true about constitutional change. Trouble with constitutional changes, it's really important and really quite boring. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, exactly, electoral reform, having tried to <laughs> push that one. And what about the fact that we don't have a political party at the moment that supports the European Union? Uh, well, um, I suppose uh, it's not going to happen within the Conservatives uh, for obvious reasons, although there may be a reaction to that at some point, especially when business, I mean, we heard what the Prime Minister thought he should do to business and he seems to be one of his few promises is he has actually F business. So, so, um, uh, at least quite a few of the businesses that I speak to. Labour has got a difficult dilemma. They don't want to look at, they don't want to fight the last battle, they've got to fight the next election. But in, in my view, Labour are in real, a real difficulty. Um, I don't see how they can be elected unless, uh, uh, I don't see how Labour can become the next government unless they do better than they've been doing in Scotland. They've got one seat. They used to have more than 40 seats out of the 56 seats in Scotland. If, if, um, if uh, Labour had held on to half their seats, even a third of their seats in, 2015. None of this would have happened. They'd have been the government, but they didn't because they, they total collapse in Scotland, almost total collapse in Scotland. So maybe they think they've got to fight the next battle rather than the last battle. But my suggestion to them is that the next battle will involve Europe. There's no question of that. And you, you've just got to decide what kind of relationship with Europe you want. And the one other thing I would say about that is that Lord Frost, who has been promoted for getting us this deal, has not been, um, well, he's, he, he, I would suggest to you that he may become the next Chris Grayling. I don't think that what he has produced is fit for purpose. And I think that will become increasingly obvious over the next few months. And in terms of the Scottish elections that we've got coming up fairly shortly, how do you think that current situation with Sturgeon and Salmon is going to impact both on votes for independence and for Labour to re-emerge yeah, um, well, I, I know, and it's, it's, you know, I can't check this, but the SNP claim that they've had, I think, more than 10,000 new um, members in the past two weeks, 10 days. Um, I, I think it's a very sad situation. My, my personal view, I don't really know what went on. I really don't. I don't think anybody, anybody does. But I do think that the prospect of a woman losing her job because a man has behaved badly probably doesn't really appeal to me at all and so whatever mistakes Nicola Sturgeon has has made and she may have made many I, I, I would say I, I don't don't really know look at it the opposite if she had not been pushing for uh, the sort of things that she pushed for and she's now criticized for we would criticize her for not taking women seriously I think so as I say I don't know the details of this but I think in the end, its impact on the elections in Scotland will not be as great as people think. And it's true that the, of the 20 or so polls uh, that have been conducted since last summer to now, I think the last one or two have shown just 50% in favour of independence, whereas a few showed about 55% before. So it may, it may have come down. But, you know, you can vote for other parties. You can vote for other parties in Scotland that support independence, including the Greens, and I think that might also happen. I've got another question for you here. Um, 
is there any hope for the future in this country? I can't see any. <laughs> no, please, please don't. don't. Oh, see you. Well, there's always the dogs. I'm sure if your, yours keeps barking, mine will join in. Um, <laughs> won't be much fun. Um, look, I think the thing that really spurred on this book, How Britain Ends, is this sense of a disjunction between the Britain I live in, the, all the incredible, bright, creative, intelligent, hardworking people that I know that make things work, and this ridiculous system that we have, where actually a bunch of mediocrities um, who all follow a tribal route end up telling us what to do. And so I think there's so many great things, and by this country in this sense, I mean the United Kingdom as a whole. I mean, you know, uh, it's said that one Cambridge college has got more Nobel Prize winners attached to it in the past than, than all of China and Japan put together. I don't know if it's true, it's too, probably too good to check, but we do know that we're a brainy country and we are, we are a problem solving country. And yet we seem to have brainless administration, which has created more problems than it's solved. So there is hope. The question is whether people can become sufficiently motivated to channel their energies and somehow throw the rascals out. And to that end, I would just chip in with my compassion in politics hat on, you know, that, that we do all have values and part of what you're describing is an abandonment of those values for political gain, either individual or collective political gain. And if we can be a nation that says, actually politicians, we want you to stand by the values that actually are about what makes this a great place to live, maybe we would start to see a shift if we started to insist on those values taking precedence over immediate short-term gain, just maybe we would see a shift. And we've certainly found through the um, APPG, which we have in parliament, that we can bring MPs together from every side of the house to talk about issues, but from the point of view of a shared value. So it doesn't matter what your political party is, what matters is what your priorities are as a politician. And, and most politicians from wh whatever side of the house they sit in, come to parliament with the same basic instinct, which is to make things better in some way. See, I, I think that's, well, I think that's absolutely admirable. And I, uh, but I, I would take, one example that really strikes uh, me, I know quite a lot of people who work for the National Health Service. I, my, as a baby, three weeks old, my life was saved by the NHS. And I remember my grandmother saying, oh, you're lucky you were born after the NHS was created because in her generation, she'd have been dead. Um, so it means a lot to me. But the NHS, despite all the fantastic work that the people in it do, which is, which is incredible, it's not very well organized. It's not the envy of the world, you know, that people think it is. It's not, because it's not co copied anywhere else. So it, surely we can get together and actually figure out what can we do that's better? Why do we have a beds crisis every winter? Forget COVID, we have it every winter. Germany doesn't have that. They pay a bit more. So should we pay more? So that's, that, for example, that seems to me a kind of consensus issue or should be a consensus issue that we could get together on, particularly now. But there's no, the, the, the problem I would say sort of respectfully, Jennifer, is there's no appetite within the top echelons of either political party or the main political parties to do this because that would be to kick away the ladder up which they have ascended, unfortunately. That's I quite like to kick it away. <laughs> well, I'm still going to hold out hope that if enough of us, if enough of us ask for what we know is right, and, and Rashford is an example of that. You know, Rashford was someone who appealed to our values and the same with with the one percent pay rise there isn't I, I i can't think of anyone who really would argue for that and politicians are out of step with us the public or certainly the majority of the public yeah, exactly but as they will say we we're, well, we're the government we've got we've got a mandate to make mess things up so but you're right i mean embarrassing them is a good way to proceed <laughs> <laughs> well, showing that there's public appetite for them to do the right thing, that there are in fact votes in doing the right thing. Yeah, that would be good too. This podcast was brought to you by the think tank Compassion in Politics. Our podcasts are part of the Real Agenda Network and they're recorded live. If you'd like to join us for a live event or receive news about other events and what we get up to at Compassion in Politics, please just go to our website, compassioninpolitics.com 
and sign up to our newsletter. And if you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe and maybe even review the podcast and make sure you don't miss any future ones by going to your favourite podcast provider and searching for CompassionInPolitics.com. Thanks so much for joining us and we look forward to being back with you again soon. Thank you.